Welcome to Kush Chopra Live. I'm Kush Chopra. Kush Chopra Live is a robust discussion on issues that matter to Singaporeans. This is a special GE 2020 edition of Kush Chopra Live. Um, any op opinions expressed by me on this live streaming are my own and do not represent any party that I'm associated with or any organization that I uh, may be a member or otherwise associated with. Um, please uh, uh, join us and um, give us your comments and your questions and we will try our best to address them. My guests today are researchers Yo Lam Kyung and Ku Sui Yong. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Kush. Hi. Thanks for having us. Great pleasure. Great to see you again. Good to see you again. Lam Kyung is the former GIC chief economist. Sui Yong is a property expert and author of several books. My guests are non partisan with no affiliation to any political party. I think that's important point to make. Yeah. The topic for the day, our GE topic for today is HDB, what happened to Versa? Ah? In February 1960, the Housing and Development Board, HDB, was established to develop low-cost rental public housing for the poor. In 1964, the home ownership scheme was introduced to help citizens to buy instead of renting their flats. The HDB scheme has evolved over the years to cater to a range of households and houses 78.6% of the population today. That's the figure I got. I, yep. I guess that's correct. Mm. However, there is today widespread anxiety about public housing in Singapore. The anxiety revolves around concerns as to first affordability and the decaying 99-year lease contract, the leasehold contract. Young people are worried that the flats cost so much now that they will work and work but end up transferring all their wealth to the state, leaving very little in their pocket to enjoy life. And I guess the parents of young people are equally worried about that future. The problem has been described as a ticking time bomb. Today we talk about the HDB problem, which surprisingly has not featured as an important election issue so far. I wonder why. Perhaps because the incumbent government controls the narrative of which issues need to be canvassed and discussed? I'm not sure. However, it appears to us to be an important issue and it is certainly time for a review our, of our public housing policy. I will ask my guests about the 99-year lease decay affordability of HDB housing, uh, the monumental uh, policy blunders at the heart of the problem, if you ask me, but you may have a different opinion. And we'll discuss possible solutions to the HDB problem. Let's start, shall we? Yep. Sure. In March 2017, National Development Minister Lawrence Wong reminded the public that the housing and development board flats must be returned to the state when their 99-year leases expire. This announcement created great public anxiety and disappointment. So my question is, is the finiteness of the 99-year lease not clear and obvious to all? It's very clear. When you sign off, when you purchase, yes. And I have to say purchase in inverted commas because um, as a reminder, anybody who is going into buying a new property, from a new flat directly from HDB or buying in the resale market, you are entering into an agreement for lease and a memorandum 
of lease. And Everyone knows about this 99 year lease. And it says 99 years. It's very clear. And so these two documents are lease documents. So there again is some confusion about whether there is real ownership or is this we'll the lease. Yeah. Why was the public surprised by this announcement? What, why do you think? Okay, um, I'm speaking as a man who's, uh, you know, had a little bit of experience in markets. So I think what's been happening here is that although the, you know, the government is not incorrect in that, and I don't think they've ever said that the 99 year lease are going to be renewed, right? They've never explicitly said that, and to be fair to them. However, given the pronouncements by um, senior uh, government leaders, including Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and Mr. Go Chok Tong, they've been given the impression that it is a desirable thing that the public can consider this, these assets part of their, you know, part of their wealth and, 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 and their assets that, that should be able to hold their value. I think, I think that impression has been given. Now, this is quite similar to uh, other markets that, for example, you've seen, uh, you know, CITIC bonds, right? In which the Chinese government somehow gave the impression to investors that these bonds are government guaranteed, where in fact they were not. However, the market priced them in as government guaranteed. So similarly here, even though the government never said that they would renew the leases, the market seemed to price it in, mistakenly, obviously, <laughs> that they would somehow be renewed, right? That they, because that of certain terms that we have used in the past two decades, for example, asset enhancement, and that it will be a nest egg. And occasionally, the ministers may even say that it is something that will keep growing in value. So this is the government who has created certain impressions and expectations, is that what you think? Yes, I think so. Yeah. And to be fair to them, I don't think they meant to create an impression that they would definitely renew the lease. They no, just, I they think just, that's a separate matter. You know, that, that, that's a separate I mean, matter. We have not seen but the unfortunately, the, 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 you know, the, the, the unfortunate uh, effect was people began to price in these assets as though the leases would be renewed, right? So you are saying that so, the so, was one of renewal? They, well, they didn't price it as an asset. Uh, where, where the value would go to zero at the end of a 1990 at least. We can say, see that from the markets, right? So for example, uh, and the evidence for that is actually market-based, right? So if you look at the prices of flats, and, and this was reported actually, um, after Lawrence Wong, Minister Lawrence Wong, made the announcement in March 2017, you can see that the older flats of 50 years plus in Lorong 7 and 9, you know, Topayo, oh, uh, over the next nine months to a year, they lost about 20% of their value, right? So this is the market pricing in what Lawrence Wong had just said accurately, that lease leases are not going to be renewed. So the market then, you know, just, let, just as with statistic bonds, began to price in the economic reality. But to be fair to the minister, he was merely reminding people mm. of the legal Situation. Yes, the, the real legal situation. Yes. Yeah. yes. That's all he was doing. That's right. And, and no, and, and I think that was the right thing to do because yes. you know obviously the market <laughs> had the wrong impression, right? Correct. And so I don't think you can say that that the current uh, group of ministers, especially uh, Minister Wong, is trying to mislead anybody. In fact, he's trying to correct the view to what is the real situation, right? Correct. So um, uh, unfortunately, having done that. We, we, the, the government has not presented a solution as to what, because if it's not going to be renewed, then we're presented with a problem, right? What is the problem? The problem is that after 99 years, no matter how high the, the price or the value of HDP flat goes between now and then or in the past, it is going to go to zero. So, so you know, that, that presents us with that problem. What are you going to do about it? Because for the bottom 50% of the population, that flat, the value of that flat, represents 90% of their life savings. Yes, we'll come to that. Now, let's move on. Uh, and I'm just going to make one point here, and, and that's an important point. And that is that the public was anxious and disappointed by Minister Wong's um, reminder because for some reason, according to, to, to you gentlemen, there was this expectation of renewal. Oh, it's a false expectation. A false expectation of renewal. Okay. So, and the question is that how that arose is answered by various 
political leaders' statements and and perhaps they, they, they could have been... Uh, In addition uh, to those statements about asset enhancements and nest egg, there was 4% evidence that uh, HDB old flats are sourced. And during those SERS uh, events, yes. um, the replacement flat plus the compensation for the trouble of having to relocate, that package was attractive. So 4% of the total stock has been SERS before. Then there was talk about asset enhancement plus your future retirement nest egg. So all these little pieces of the jigsaw puzzle came together to, to, to set an expectation that it is okay for me and so, to... And so how, how Minister Wong actually actually um, uh, took away that expectation or brought it back to earth to reality was he also said and and it suddenly came to light that not everybody will be served yes that, in fact the statistics show that only four yeah. percent are going to be served and he gave no indication that that would be any different in the future so you brought up therefore an important point yes and that is that the anxiety and disappointment was not just about the fact that there would be no renewal and quite frankly it's surprising that anybody would have, uh, you know, as, as a legal man myself, thought that there would be a renewal unless there was an option to renew. Mm. There was none, yeah. right? But the public may not be uh, so clear in their minds. And secondly, what you're saying, and that's, that's the important point you, you, you made, which was that there was this um, disappointment that not all flats would be served, yes. right? So I think... And therefore, there was a disappointment and correction in the market prices, yes. and you can see it. Yes, yes, and that, that reflects that. So, I think we've understood the uh, anxiety and, and disappointment. Thank you for that. Let's move on to ownership. The government insists that HDB leaseholds confer ownership rights for a finite term, for a finite 99-year term. Are those who pay for a new HDB flat lessees for its 99-year term? Are they not lessees? I am still confused about that point and the definition after these three years of uh, public discourse. I think what uh, the statement is clear uh, is that you do own the 99-year rights but whether you do own the flat, do you own the flat as the, as the title and to the physical um, uh, asset? Um, that part is, to me, still unclear. You, you do own the 99-year lease. Let me put my question another way. Mm. And actually, I'm looking for a very obvious answer. From all the documents that you've seen, the HDB documents, they describe the buyer as a lessee, do they not? Yes. So, and well, so you, well you don't own strata title, right? You don't own strata So, unlike a condo, you do so not own strata title. The is that you are a lessee for its 99 year term. I think that's incontrovertible, and anything else is just pure political sophistry and trying to confuse the public. That's your opinion as a leader. That's my right? opinion, uh, you know, categorically. Do you own your HDB flat or are you a lessee who has paid rent up front for 99 years? This is the part which I'm still working on. I'm uh, okay. unclear about that. Fine. Does it matter? I think in does the label matter? I, I think, in, the, I, think, I, think in, I think in terms of the important way in which it perhaps doesn't matter too much yes. is the fact that it has conferred upon whether leases or owners or you know, hybrid, um, a certain asset value Correct. that has gone up with the market, right? Yes. So they have now that, I mean, the assets have gone up with the big boom in global and local property prices. So whatever, whatever nature of this asset is, it is worth that much. Correct. And this forms 90% of their life savings and it's a significant, huge capital windfall gain, right? So I think, I think in that sense, it doesn't, what, what, whatever you call it, exactly. doesn't matter in terms of it, it is currently, if sold in the market, money in the bank, that it can be used for retirement. So in that sense, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. In fact, that's my view, that the label ought not to matter. And I wish that the government did not belabor that point and go to the extent of doing this song and dance about ownership. Yes, there are certainly ownership rights 
within a, a, a leasehold yes. contract. And we recognize that. But at the same time, these are lessees. So you have both. So that's your opinion as a legal man. So I think Could so. You, you know, you, you, that's you, interesting. You Thank you. Yes. You have certainly both uh, concepts uh, that, that um, um, are, are prevalent in a, in a HDB contract. And I wish that they actually said what you have just said, which is that it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's not the label, but the substance of your home ownership yes. that matters. And, and I will not quarrel with uh, um, any notion of home ownership because that's exactly what it that's practically amounts interesting to. Interesting to hear you say that. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, of course. That's my, my own uh, personal opinion, of course. Yeah. Say you are an SME owner. You have got a fully paid up HDB flat. You can't pledge the value of your flat into your joint venture agreement yeah. with your fellow shareholders. Yeah. Right. So that is one restriction and that dif differentiates yes. whether you actually own the flat versus owning a 99-year leasehold property or even a 30-year leasehold industrial property which can actually be pledged to a business amongst your shareholders. Right. There's so, certain areas in yeah. which it really does matter, right? right. Correct. Yeah. So there are certain limitations yes. and, and that support the view that this is not ownership. In but the full complete sense. In the full complete sense. Private but property. It's a unique, it's, um, it's, it's simply a unique leasehold contract. Yes, which as, as, far, as far as retirement adequacy goes, yes. it, it does fulfill the function of having an asset that you can use. Well, yes, we'll yes. come to that. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, mm -hmm. uh, substantially, mm -hmm. this is a, uh, uh, it's home ownership. Yes. You know, and, and you, you, you can, you cannot say that it's not. So, however, the public disagrees with the ministerial announcement and argue that the state should provide compensation when flat leases run out, right? I'm bringing you back to the 99-year um, lease decay problem and this idea of ownership. What is the crux of the actual problem here? Why is the public adamant that they be provided with compensation. I there think, was this... I think in practical I'm terms... I'm moving on to the, another part. The, the yes. practical terms, the main, the main thing is, is the financial consequence to them um, in terms of their retirement adequacy, right? Because as I mentioned before, 50%, more than 50% of the population, 90% of their life savings is in the value of HDB flat. So if in the time, let us say, a guy, you know, uh, when he's 25 years old, he buys a flat. By the time he's 65 years old, the flat is 40 years old, right? And from then on, because it will go to zero in 100 years, it begins to decay increasingly rapidly. So imagine if you had 90% retirement asset that is decaying to, to zero over the remaining part of your retirement. That is the very concrete, practical problem why people are looking for some form of compensation because otherwise, how are they going to finance their retirement? So this is at the root of it. Quite right, but that problem arose as a matter of um, how much money was plonked into HDB. Among other things. And market factors, as it were, and, and how it turned out, how the scheme has turned out today. Yes. And we'll come to that. But for now, I'd like to ask you whether you think the government's ownership narrative created certain expectations. This brings us back to that very first point that uh, you, you brought up. But yes, and I think this question has been answered by you, that yes, the ownership narrative itself has created perhaps this problem, uh, the, the anxiety, I, because I own it, right? Maybe I rephrase that part to say that the encouragement for all households to own a roof over their heads, ownership, um, made us put in a lot more of our savings, including from the CPF ordinary account. And it encouraged us to put in savings into this property for the next 30 years. But it didn't teach us that at the end of 30 years, when both husband and wife are heading into retirement at 55 to 65 years old, that you have got to start thinking about where is your source of cash uh, that would help you 
survive from 65 yeah. years old onwards till 85. Yes. Yeah. Retirement and retirement adequacy. So this has come up. The realization is only happening now. In fact, it, it almost so, seems so I think, I think there were several. Issue, and we'll deal with that specifically. I think there were several unintended consequences of, of, of sure. this impression, mm. given that you know this would be the main source, and you could rely on this as a source of retirement. First, the the the, in, the inadequate understanding that the that, that, that the lease would end, right? Uh, and somehow misimpression that it could perhaps be renewed by the SERS program that, that, that happened for 4% of the population, that people thought maybe everybody can get it, that, that kind of impression. So These impressions are often created in the market, for example, the CITIC bonds, right? So, for example, people think they're government guaranteed, they're actually not. So, so that's one. But the, there were several policy uh, things, that, policy issues that were going on at the time that exacerbated this perhaps unwittingly, right? So um, I would say that, that one policy issue um, that, that exacerbated and helped create this problem was the one we discussed the other time, which was the excessive immigration issue. Now, the excessive immigration for the last, you know, for 20 years between 1990 and, and, and 2010, artificially depressed. I'm coming to that actually. The, so, yeah. Um, because we are now going, we are going to discuss the specific policy considerations and the implications. So sure. perhaps let's hold off that discussion. Okay. I'm coming yeah. to interrupt you. Sure, go ahead. Uh, because, you know, otherwise it'll, we okay. will uh, be going all over the shop, as it were. Yeah. Let's yeah. stick now. There is a question uh, yes. from the audience. Yes. So the, the, the audience yes, please. asked whether if it is a long-term lease, why is it that we have got to pay the sinking fund, property tax, which are normally paid by landlords. So um, there are various types of long-term leases and in commercial leases, for example, or in the USA, they are the more common type of leases, actually tenants are supposed to bear insurance, property tax, as well as some of the outgoings for maintenance. So um, here, Mr. Richard Goh's question specifically is asking about question, a comparison of uh, Singapore's private residential lease versus a uh, HDB lease. But, so um, I'm just trying to clarify that there are various terms that you can add into a lease where tenants could also be liable for property for tax. Yeah, it's basically an agreement between tenant and lessee. I hope that answers the question and I think that, that mm. does. Coming back to the uh, ownership um, point and the mm. ownership narrative. Sure. Um, it's my view that the government must take some responsibility for the anxiety and disappointment that we've got and that the ownership narrative um, could be one of the reasons that has given rise uh, to this, to the expectations that you brought up earlier. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is a HDB flat a gold mine or a ticking time bomb? In fact, well, from the point of view of retirement adequacy, it, it is a time bomb, right? Right. Because as I explained before, you know, imagine your main ninety percent you are invested in one stock, yes. Right, and and this stock from the time you retire, age sixty-five, over the next you know uh, sixty years, or thirty years, goes rapidly towards zero. How would you feel about that in terms of your retirement adequacy? Yes. So that is a that is a problem. It is right. So, and, and it's just one asset, right? Yes. It's not diversified into, into in any other. In addition to that, for <laughs> those who actually have sufficient cash reserves and savings on the side, yeah. um, even though they are staying in a 40-year-old flat, they are, they are in a second mind to actually wish that by the time they pass on, that this flat could be handed over to the next generation and it would still have value, right? Yes. And so maybe they are, they are going to be passing on in uh, 15, 20 years, that's the expectation, and that they thought that their children would inherit something of value from them. And the realisation that, hey, not everybody is going to be served means that the valuation by the time I hand it over to my children when I pass they on... They have zero bequests. Yeah. Zero or much lower much bequest lower value. Bequests, yeah. And so that disappointment probably caught everybody by surprise. It was to say we all work uh, to ensure that the fruits of our labour become a legacy mm. that we can bequeath. Yes. And, and that's a strong. fundamental economic concept, actually. Yes, it's very important to especially Asian families, right? So, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way the HDB system operates, mm. 
the fruits of our labor are being undermined. Well, the 99-year lease, uh, if, it, if it's stuck to without renewal or without SERS, will frustrate that bequest. Exactly. Right? Mm. So, but that's a very big topic. And it's, we, a, it's a big it, topic. But certainly yeah, one but of the important, fundamental points. It is important to people. Points, yeah, mm. One fundamental point. Let's move on. We have a lot to cover. Affordability. Public housing must be affordable. What is the measure for affordability of public housing? I think this is an important topic that's often misunderstood. Um, to me, the most important measure of affordability is the one that's given anecdotally by a lot. If you ask a lot of young people, they say, well, we spent all our lives paying for our flat and we have nothing left for retirement, for education of kids. I think the fact is that people over their lifetime have a limited lifetime income, right? And um, they need to spend on certain big ticket items over their lifetime, the most important of which is their retirement. Okay, but after that also comes the kids' education. They also have sometimes a need to start a business, right? So these are the big t ticket items that people need. And if they have to spend 90% of that, or 80% of that, if they, have to sp if they have to pay off a flat for 25 years, right, of, of, of their working life, of 30 or 40 years, then they have very little left, you know, for these other big ticket items, especially retirement adequacy. So, so you have to measure, therefore, one good measure is the number of years it takes to pay off with you know, your full CPF entitlement flat, right? And right now, uh, given current price, uh, the average repayment time is about 25 years, yeah. 20 to 25 years. And uh, a more affordable, uh, I think, sensible retirement time, which we should strive for, is perhaps 10 to 15 years, right? So maybe a third of your retirement, of, of your working life is spent working for your property, fair enough, but you still have, you know, is this a Singapore-centric figure, or is this a generally accepted um, economic idea? Uh, I think most, most idea people, people study worldwide. You know, worldwide. You know, what, yeah. you know, what, what is affordable? Yeah. They they would recommend something that, that like this, right? That ten you, to fifteen years. 50, ten to fifteen year re repayment period. The fact of the matter is that in the eighties, and I've I've had several conversations with friends, and especially. Uh, slightly more elderly friends, who told me that it took them seven years to pay off for their HDB yes. four-room flat. Indeed. So, so I mean, I'd like to... Like they've to gone from seven to 25 years. Yes. So actually, it, <laughs> the 25-year repayment period is a relatively recent phenomenon, actually, in HDB history. Yeah. So most of HDB history, right up to the 80s, and perhaps even the early 90s, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the repayment period was about 10 years, 10 to 15 years, yeah. right? Well, because, because this was before the great inflation in property prices, Worldwide and in particular in Singapore because yes. of the restricted area, right? So uh, the the system when it was designed and run for the first thirty years was re designed, as you say, run on 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 as you say a seven to fifteen it year was repayment. An excellent scheme. Yes. It, no, right. it, it, it it was affordable it, it in was that affordable. sense. In that sense, seven right? years, seven to ten years. Yeah, let let's say done. yeah, seven to ten in the good years. But let us say on average between seven to fifteen years. You know that. No, that, it was uh, never that. I'm so sorry, but you know right. it was. In the early years, yeah, between, in the early years, was, yes, and, yes. And, and that's a fact. Yeah. And um, what I'm trying to suggest is that 10 to 15, I think we, we ought to be, if this is public housing, mm -hmm. we're not talking housing, and that's an important point. I don't know when you gave me uh, your explanation whether you were mm -hmm. talking about public housing or housing in general. No, public housing. Public housing, yes. right. All right, well, I'll defer to your expertise and, and uh, as, as a... But I think, I, I think member my of the public, I would prefer to, a, to a repayment, repayment period of yes. seven to ten years. I'm, yes. I'm sorry, but that, sure. that um, but I should not, um, I should not be so irresponsible as to suggest that that is the uh, a target because that may be unrealistic. You know, perhaps it was realistic earlier when property but prices were much not, lower. Not today. Yeah. So this is something we can discuss in greater detail, and we should have that debate hmm. in Parliament, hopefully. Yes, I think mean, that would be great. If we I could. think it would be great if we did have that debate in Parliament. Yeah. But for now, we have to press on. I'm sorry, did you want to say something, Sia? Please. Oh, please carry on. Thank you. Many people feel that the HDB flat is very expensive. It is, right? I, I don't think well, we need to belabor this point. That if, if you, could, if you if, said 25 if years. If they could yeah. repay yeah. it within 10 to 15 years, they wouldn't say it's so expensive. So it is. Yes. It, it is, by, by all accounts. And in fact, it's not affordable. Um, when, you, when you look at the repayment periods, yes. it's, it's not. In fact, if, this, if it were priced low enough that 
repayment could be done 10 to 15 years. Um, somebody starts his career at 25. By the time he's 35 to 40, he has finished repaying for his flat. He then would be accumulating savings that would be paying for his children's university. And at the same time, he might be accumulating more savings for his retirement. For before retirement, mm -hmm. entrepreneurial pursuits. Yeah. He might be investing in a side business. Yes, he right. might be allocating some of his funds into a stock portfolio or a bond portfolio and then start to consider his retirement. Yeah. You need to start accumulating. Mm -hmm. But if you were to pay off a home loan only after 25 years, you would be 40-something years old by then. And if you were a PMAT who is uh, having Just a lost job, your job. Uh, you have no chance of saving for retirement. It might actually affect um, the entrepreneurial drive yes. in Singapore. And maybe one, one of the, the risk, factors right? yeah. yes. Yes. that why people are so risk averse. Correct. Yes. And that's why we are a yeah. SME country. We are mm. not an SME country. Mm. Yes. And, and it's a pity. Mm. We have to solve this problem. And that's why we are talking about mm. it. So that's, that's a, good, a good way of considering affordability, you think? Yes. Yeah. And, and why it should be. Mm. So on that note, I'd like to say that I find it very surprising for the government to tell the public all the time that HDB is affordable, it will be affordable, don't worry. In my opinion, it's not. On the measures that we have just discussed. Let's talk a little bit about wealth transfer and I'm not sure whether that video that we received last night in, on WhatsApp is available. It's not available. But there was a young man, a, a, a video circulating, that expressed this issue well. He talked about basically how little money is left or, or how uh, um, wealth is transferred. Our youth are not worried about the supply of HDB flats. They are worried about the nature and extent to which their wealth will be used to buy a house. And how little is left at the end of of paying for their flats, which is a very related point to affordability. Does the HDB flat operate as excessive transfer of wealth to the state? I, I'm not sure that it's useful to look at it that way, but I, I think it's, it's perhaps more useful to say that the prices at which the flats are charged uh, perhaps um, you've got to keep in mind that there are a lot of grants given, right, from, from the sticker price of the flats. And so actually, um, you know, flats are being brought towards affordable levels. I think we have, to, we have to, to admit that the government is trying to increase the grants, and they have in recent years, right, so that it becomes more affordable to, on the criteria we just discussed, that it can be repaid back for 10, 15 years, right? But it would be much more useful if, if, if everybody knew from the start that when I buy an HDB flat, you know, I don't have to worry, if my, can I get a grant because I'm near my parents, can I get a grant for A, B, C, D, E, that you know, you'll know for certain that you can repay it as, as, as the early flats were, right? Yeah. Then Give 10 to 15 years. Discount. Give a straight discount. Give a straight discount. price. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, 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 but it must, to be fair to the government, then be done in a way that is affordable, right? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't require too much from fiscal resources that is unsustainable. So, I mean, we, we have to ask what is a reasonable price for those HDB flats and can that reasonable price be affordable on the criteria we just discussed, which is payable back in 10 to 15 years? I guess a lot of these issues go back to how reasonably we can price HDB. Yeah. And I, I think that's the heart of the issue. It's the, at the heart of the issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And we'll come to that. Yeah. Um, these fundamental the, the fundamentals we've just discussed uh, bring us to the next section of our discussion today. And um, I'm now going to refer to several policies that this government has been responsible for. And I'd like you to tell me whether you think they are equally at the heart of the problem. 
First and foremost, CPF use and retirement adequacy issues. In fact, half of our discussion just now revolved around this. Mm -hmm. um, there are three issues that arise here to my mind. Mm -hmm. But before I do that, I'm going to, to ask that Casey Young's question be left there and that I will come to it in a bit. But um, because it, 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 it's related to one of the policies that we are going to discuss. First, in 1968, the Central Provident Fund Amendment Act was passed to allow citizens to use their CPF to pay for HDB flats. This enabled Singaporeans to pay their down payments and monthly loans with the CPF savings. My question is this. Is this not tantamount to using housing as social security? Um... I would say not necessarily. Okay, so I think first of all you have to keep in mind that the CPF contribution rate is the compulsory contribution rate is pretty high. In fact, for low wage and mid middle wage workers, it's among the highest compulsory contribution rates in the world. Right. Therefore, not to allow any of it to be used for housing is also unreasonable, because then where are they going to find the money <laughs> in their remaining take-home pay to buy a house? Right. So I mean, it was an entirely reasonable proposition to allow for some of the CPF to be used, um, or a good bit of CPF to be used to purchase a house. So that in itself is not tantamount to, you know... Uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Academically speaking or theoretically three, speaking? No, practically speaking... But in reality, not. half of our discussion just now mm -hmm. contradicts what you just said now. I think not necessarily because, I mean, there are other parts to the equation as well, right? So mm -hmm. the other parts of the equation are... Um, if, you, if the CPF part is allowed to, to be used for housing, for example, one question that can be asked is that for different classes of income earners, is there a limit to which you can use it? You know, so for example, if a guy is earning a low wage, are you allowing him to buy a five-room flat which is clearly beyond his means or try and buy a, a private property, right? So should there be guidelines as to, yes, we, re we recognise that CPF is needed both for your retirement and, and your housing, so we need to have certain certain balance between the two, and therefore there are certain restrictions. Depend so yes. so a, a, are, a, a are those restrictions in place to safeguard? So and that's so the first question. Special right? account was then introduced so to and made it safe. As social security, yeah. it's not a bad thing. Is that what you're saying? Actually, if you look at the World Bank studies, housing is one of the pillars of social security, right? But it cannot be the only pillar. There are four pillars of social security. The, the, the problem is making one pillar dominate and to be so gigantic, be undiversified, that it dominates all and you're too reliant on that one pillar. So the first is, 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 is it, yes, there's nothing wrong with it, but you can't do it in excess, right? That's the first point. The second point is that, are you compensating through the CPF, uh, the, the, the owners, for the existing non-housing funds that they're putting away in CPF, right? So is the CPF interest rate adequate to build their non-housing savings over their working life to a sufficient level that it, it balances the two pillars, right? The CPF savings in the house and the CPF savings in, in financial assets, right? And I think here, uh, perhaps, you know, the CPF interest rate was too low. I mean, we could have afforded to give them you know, in the, at the end of the day, what GIC made over that period of time, right? Or closer to what GIC gave to that period of time, but which would have been one, at least 1% or 2% higher than, than the, the CPF rates they got. And if you take another 1% or 2%, say 2%, compounded over a 40-year working life, for the remaining assets, you know, even though housing would tend to dominate still, I take your point, um, it would not have dominated so much. So what are the challenges in framing HDB leaseholds as an appreciating asset that provides a source of retirement income. What are the challenges? I think you've alluded to... to yeah, there are challenges because you, you are uh, essentially um, banking only on one asset, right? And that in any uh, savings portfolio is unwise, not diversified enough. It's like buying a single stock. <laughs> Secondly, as yes, a 65, 70-year-old, you can't liquidate your flat and still live in it and still enjoy the fruits of your yes. earnings of the last as you 30 years. Say, say, a, a, a financial asset, right? Yeah. So, and and you, most so. of the younger people today, and me included, 
I put in as much as was allowed from the ordinary account into my home. Meaning that in the last 25 years, I have actually not been earning the CPF ordinary accounts 2.5%. per. I never allowed it to, to accumulate uh, yes. interest for me. Right. And I'm using CPF's money um, in my ordinary account where I failed to earn the interest of 2.5% and I'm using it to pay the bank Correct. their interest charges. So you add that up together, my interest expense because I had opportunity cost of 2.5% plus I paid the bank another 2%, I'm down by 4.5%. And, and that over a 40-year period is, is, is a big, it's a big handicap, right? And so, and besides that, then there's another related policy, right, which you alluded to, which, yes. is, which is the excessive immigration policy, right? That's and true. So, and so what that did yes. was that it, it kind of depressed wages right at the bottom. Yes. So for the bottom 20% of, of yes. people who are saving from their salaries, they would have saved that much less because their wages over 20 years were being depressed, right? Yeah. So meanwhile, you know, of course, there was this boom in property prices. Because of immigration. <laughs> because of right. immigration. And because of interest rates are coming down mm. and we had limited land. So this boom, so on the one hand, the prices of that you have to pay for these flats are going up and up and up. Whereas, whereas the, your ability to pay for them from your wages is, was, was being dampened, right? So now none of this was intended, right? I mean, this it turned out to be a policy error in hindsight, right? But it was a Excessive big policy error. Immigration, Excessive immigration. In fact, it, it, it had an unintended consequence. Deflationary pressures on the housing market on the one hand, and deflationary pressures on, on the wages and the ability to to save outside the amount spent on the house on the other, right? right? And so the the net consequence of all of these, together with the rising housing prices meant that we got to the situation today where, where, where the housing asset becomes the dominant asset yes. for the bottom 50%, is it yes. 90% in, in their savings portfolio. Yes. I, I, which is an undesirable situation <laughs> for a retirement asset, right? We come back to retirement adequacy, but I take completely your point. So this was another policy uh, uh, blunder in my, in, in my view uh, that uh, the government has to, to, to account for. But... Um, It's something that needs to be looked in totality. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's the entire HDB system. So sh there are a few other policies that we must talk about. But first, sticking to retirement adequacy. Should we be linking retirement adequacy to the remainder value of public housing? Public housing. Well, I think that... Does it matter? Whether it matters right now if the, if the lease is going to zero, right? If the lease wasn't going to zero, if everybody was going to get a service, right, then it would still not be optimal in the sense that you're still relying on one single asset, but at least you're preserving the value of that. That asset is, a, is not for certain going to zero. Let's talk about <laughs> the favourite year that's uh, been talking in the going on in the market right now, the year 2030. In the year 2030, the stock of HDB flats that are above 40 years age would be about half a million? That's half the stock of land. Half, the stock. half of the current stock, but by the time 2030 comes, maybe it's about 35 to 40% 40 of, the of the because stock because we are currently building more, right? Mm -hmm. And if 500,000 flats are at the 40 years age plus minus and, you, and there are many more retirees starting from the year 2030 than today because the baby boomers are now moving into the post-65 years old age. What would their expectation be and how would they be able to survive on their, their beautiful bricks if um, a lot of their CPF has already gone into the property and then... Yeah. Cash savings is insufficient. And, 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 and the property prices then tend to move to work. Exactly. That brings me to the second point yeah. and, and the second problem with using CPF to fund public housing, which is that you are risking your retirement savings on both property prices and interest rates. Housing prices do not rise indefinitely and interest rates go up and down. Why are we allowing our citizens to take this risk on their nest egg? I think that, as, as I mentioned, some of it was an unintended consequence, right? So on the one hand, you had three forces. One was out of your control, property prices shooting up, 
You know, uh, the, the other one was that you didn't expect that all their wages are going to be depressed as much by this immigration. That was another unintended consequence. Third is that you did not compensate them enough in the CPF interest rate for their non-housing rights. And this happened for, for such, a, such a long time. So the, the confluence of these three things led to this current sorry situation, right? So the question really is, what happened? This is our, in, our, our, inherited, our inherited problem, right? It's an inheri in, inherited current problem. Yes. And, and, and but what do we do about it yes. in future, right? Because, you know, you can't unwind it overnight. Yes. What are the pragmatic solutions towards, to, to, to this? But we must acknowledge that it was government policy that put us into this position. And maybe they, they really should have thought about that before they allowed CPF usage. I agree that it's a very complex problem and perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we can say this quite easily. But at that time, I'm, it may not have been so clear. I, I, to be fair, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's got us into this conundrum. So the question is whether we should stop the uh, CPF being used to pay for housing. That's my third issue. Um, but I think you've answered that. Because there are studies and OECD studies that, that say, you know, well, the use so. of, um, you know, public housing, uh, CPF for public housing has resulted in retirement inadequacy. No, I think the, the World Bank study is that yes. uses of savings for uh, lifetime savings for housing is an important component yes. of retirement adequacy. The capitalization of that is important. Is one of the pillars of retirement adequacy. With the study that you just mentioned, the, the World the Bank study. And, and therefore, you've actually answered the question. The question mm -hmm. is not that it's wrong, inherently mm -hmm. wrong. The question is about the concentration. Yes. And that's the problem. That's so the I think that's understood. Yes. And I hope our viewers have also understood that. Mm -hmm. It's a... Um, let's now talk about the uh, asset enhancement scheme and what that did to HDB prices and HDB. Um, When Go Chok Tong became Prime Minister in 1990, he introduced the Assets Enhancements Policy, which was supposed to help enhance the prices of HDB flats for Singaporeans. To my mind, the Asset Enhancement Scheme has created three related problems, and I'll discuss each one of them. First and foremost, the scheme appeared to have transformed overnight Overpriced appreciating leasehold public housing into appreciating assets. Should HDB flats be priced as public housing or private assets? I think the. We, we, like I say, we have an inherited problem, right? Yes. So my view is, and I think the view that, that, that Suyong and I have taken in our study on HDB form, the FOSG, and the FOSG study, FOSG I should mention. Yes, is that for new buyers, it should be priced at, as public housing mm. right, to, in order for it to be affordable. But for the existing holders of HDB assets, which are far more numerous than, than the flow of existing buyers, but you know, the, the stock of people who have HDB assets, there should be an effort at asset preservation, you know? Yes, but that's a separate problem and that's an inherited reality that we will come to. Correct. But as a matter of principle, public housing is public housing. As a matter of principle, new public housing for, for people, I agree with you that for new buyers, it should, be, it should be priced affordably, right? It should have been priced affordably from day one to day now. But yes. that's, that's the point I'm making. Yes. But so the question is, how, how do we do so? Without no, affecting that's the not price. The at the moment, we we'll right. get to that because that's the, the solution part of it, and there there, there are so many schemes, and mm. that will take some discussion. And uh, the FOSG uh, solution is a very compelling and interesting one. It's only one solution, but, huh? and yeah. it's only one solution, mm. and a lot has been said about mm. it. And you can find, um, you can Google this, and and you will find a lot of uh, information, and you'll find the report itself, yes. and it's worth reading. Um, should the government stop? misrepresenting decaying leasehold public housing as appreciating property assets? I think they, they should and they have. <laughs> so that's what Lawrence Wong did, right? And I'm I think sure. they're trying to, right? I think they're trying, I mean, from our conversations with them, they're trying their best to do that and fight against uh, the public op 
misperception that they are appreciating assets, right? So I think, I think and you can see in the prices, the prices are coming down, so they're succeeding. The, the stance now may be that uh, the upcoming uh, proposed VERSE, the Voluntary Enhancement Scheme, Redevelopment Scheme, as well as upgradings in future, mm -hmm. would be more to preserve and hold value rather than to uh, enhance value. But then, of course, even if you preserve and held value as it approaches the 99 years, it would still reach zero. So, so thankfully, from the, your interactions with the ministers, there well, seems to be a slight retreat government. from this asset enhancement narrative. Or am I putting I it they, to... I, no, I think, I think to, you, you, have to, you have to look at it in a more complex way. Key. They are trying to, on the one hand, prevent the collapse of asset value, right. uh, preserve asset value the yeah. best they can. Although I do not think the solutions they've come out with are adequate to the task, but they're trying to. Right. Um, they are also trying not to give the impression that this is a leasehold that will not go to zero uh, as a 99 years. They're trying to correct that impression, right? right? So it's a rather difficult task because on the one hand, you have to tell people, yes, it's going to go to zero in 99 years. On the other hand, I'm trying to preserve the value as best I can. Yes, right? but, uh, <laughs> in the last few days of the GE hustings, you mm. actually haven't heard them um, dangling the upgrading carrot as much it's as all. opposed to the last two and GEs. Hence the, uh, the, the, the title of uh, today's uh, topic for discussion, what happened to Verse, huh? you know? Sir, All of a sudden, words. It was uh, it was called words. Well, yeah. Words, whatever that means. No, I mean, I think I think the, the the real solution to the to the asset to the asset, asset decay asset protection problem is sir, it's not verse, right? Verse yes. is an attempt. Given we do not give SERS to everybody, can we find another mechanism which they call VERS? Mm. Right? Which we don't know anything about. Uh, they give like some bare bones, bare, bare bones, it, it, it happens with the flat, 70 years old. At 70 years age. You need, you need to get a, a, a quorum in order for it to happen. Correct. Uh, you can sell the price kind of an on -block based scheme. on on-block scheme, yeah. voluntary at market prices, but not much more than that. We have another 15 years to go before we start dealing with that yes, because and, of this. And then the problem with that, that, with that scheme is that when the flat reaches 70 years, we'll already have lost uh, quite a lot of its value. So it's a little too late, right? It's yes. like it's trying to bolt the gate after the horse, close the gate after the horse is bolted. Yeah. So that was an attempt at a solution, but in, in our view and in view of Rickham Kana, who has written it up in Straits Times, it's an inadequate solution. We are at the one hour mark and uh, we have still uh, plenty to talk about. Let's move on, shall we? Um, in terms of the asset enhancement scheme, there are two other points I want to make, but I'll make them very briefly. And please respond if you. One of them has to do with your own view when you spoke to Nikkei about our systemic problems. And uh, you talked about this market-based approach in terms of the pricing and ownership of HDB flats as being the problem. Would you like to comment on that? Okay, so at one stage uh, under uh, Minister Mabo Tan, there was, uh, there was a move towards pricing BTO flats at market, right? At yes. resale market prices. And, 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 and uh, that unfortunately made housing extremely unaffordable. Yes. unaffordable. However, to be fair, they have retreat, we have retreated from that policy. So today, uh, we are trying to offer what they call subsidies, right? that bring it down from, you know, uh, uh, list, even listed price. They put list prices below resale prices and then try and push it towards affordable by prices by giving more grants and yeah. subsidies. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, um, but that move was certainly a mistake and now we are in the process of retreating from it. We've gone a considerable way, but perhaps we think not enough. Not enough, especially if you view the current income situation as um, we are moving towards a society of uh, disrupted jobs, a lot more of a gig type of contract work where people can't plan a 30-year career. So how can you plan for a 25-year loan repayment if you're uncertain whether you get careers that will last 30 years? So I think we need to retreat even more and discount BTO prices even further. Yes, and so, so, so this current ad hoc way of discounting seems it, it's an attempt, but it's not fit for purpose. It, it cannot meet the needs of the new labour market economy, which is a gig economy, on certain employment contracts. Thank you for that.
The third problem that I found with the asset enhancement scheme was that PM Go said that it was in your interest to ensure that the value of your flats continue to rise. The policy created unprecedented inflationary pressure on property prices in Singapore. The prices of HDB flats shot up 400% from 1990 to 1996. Let me say that again. 400% from 1990 to 1996. Can we, can the value of any 90 nine-year property can continue to rise perpetually? Well, I think there was a big inflation in prices in the 90s. I'm not sure if it was, you know, 400% in those six years. But, I mean, there was, there was certainly a huge price inflation. Well, but I think, I, I don't think you can blame the government entirely for it. There's a right? study that I read, and so, um, so that we are not puffed on that, Right. Let me be very clear to say that uh, I stand open to being corrected on this assertion. But there certainly was a very steep, It was a sharp... Yeah, and and uh, not just in HDB, we, we've seen it in private property as well, yeah. right? So we all yeah. know that there was yeah. a huge property in price yes. inflation. Now, the government was not entirely to blame for that, right? Part of it was the global fall in interest rates from, from the 80s, right. which drove up property prices everywhere. Okay, and us in particular, because of restricted land, the government had its hand in it by having excess immigration, which pushed out the property prices, yes. you know, and... Um, At that time, income growth was fantastic. Singapore was one of the four Asian tigers. Right. Jobs were plentiful. Many people were having one and a half jobs, right? right? So, so affordability yeah. at that time was good. Today, yeah. the income situation is drastically different. Yes. Right. Um, I think that's a fair mm. point to make. That all right, you know, um, uh, we, we've had unprecedented uh, uh, boom in property prices. Yes. It may not be entirely due to the asset enhancement scheme. It no. may be too far to pin it on uh, poor <laughs> right. Mr. Go Chok Tong. Yes, that's right. Uh, I don't think he was. I don't, it's, it's I don't think fun, he was that powerful. It's great fun to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was but, that powerful. But even but though maybe you know, not so fair. There, yes, there quite unfair. Other other factors. Yeah. Maybe I'll leave it there, mm. and and we can have that debate. Uh, as well, and, and, and I think we've fairly dealt with that point. Yeah. Um, excessive immigration we've talked about. Let's talk about land costs. The price of HDB includes land costs. Do we know if land costs are priced in at market value? I think that's a difficult question to answer because the effective price of the buyer now is very much dependent on the listed price minus grants and subsidies, right? That's effectively what you pay for at the end, you know, at the end of the day. But um, w what, what is clearer is that not everybody gets the flats without land costs. So what's clear is that you don't, not, is most people pay some element. Transparency? Some element. No, well, well, should we have more transparency? We should, but what you, how you can calculate that is the fact that if you just take construction costs alone, mm. right, and, and we, 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 can, we can get that from the data, certainly the average price paid now, even after grants, on average, is above construction, significantly above construction costs. Yes, right? and we can also examine the built to order, the BTO flats that are coming up in the non matured estates versus estates such as um, uh, Kalang, Tiong Baru, that is that is more central, you can compare the three-room, four-room new BTO prices and you see that the matured estates as well as those that are nearer city centre, they are priced higher. And so Bidadari is one of the estates nearer town, it was very popular. The pricing of the three- and four-room flats was significantly higher than those that would be launched in Chua Chu Kang or Seng Kang. Correct. So you can infer that there is an imputed land value inside okay. the price. Certainly for location, but let us take you know, uh, a, a lower benchmark, a more common benchmark. Let us say, in, say uh, off, out, out of central new, new towns, right? Like, let's say Senkang, right? something like that, Pongol. Right? Um, I think that there, on average, even after subsidy, people are paying more than construction costs. Yeah. Right? And that payment above construction costs is what makes it unaffordable in the sense that it, it pushes the repayment period towards 20, 25 years yes. rather than what we desired at least 10, 15 years. You were thinking about 7 to 10 years, right? 7 to 10. But 
you yeah, don't but, mind. But it's probably, prob that may be not realistic, but no. 10 to 15 is certainly realistic. Yeah. yeah. That brings us to a very important question. And that is, do you see anything wrong with pricing in land costs for a 99-year leasehold public housing? And then there's a related question from uh, Mr. Casey Young, which may maybe I will ask if he says buyers of HDB flats bought the flat with, l sorry, it's disappeared, with land prices built in at open market prices. The question now arises is when the l lease runs out, why is the land worth nothing to the buyers? Yeah, I think I've heard variations of this question, it's a fair asked, question and I think let's address that. Yeah. Because you have used it for 99 years and so the underlying lease value, you consider a it as a it's land wrong. rent uh, that you have paid over. That. So you have used it, it the same as a COE, you have used it for 10 years, the COE has expired, there's no residual value. Right, but I mean, so, so, that, so that particular question of equity is different from the question from which you're ask, also asking, which is yes. that, should we impute land costs into public housing? And I think right? your FOSG uh, study and, has. And we think we shouldn't. About that. We shouldn't. Yes. And the reason we shouldn't is because since it's public housing, yes. it should be made as affordable as possible within reasonable bounds, right? As yes. long as it is above construction costs. Yes. And right? the government so, at the end of the day still owns the land. Yes. And in fact, 99 years later, in a better economy and with higher plot ratios, in fact, the land value would have accumulated more and it all accrues back into our reserves in land value. Right. So and, so, and, and so therefore, for affordability point of view, since public housing is about affordability, yes, right? it is. at least for new That's buyers, we're right? we, we are not talking about existing right. stock of, yeah. of asset protection, yeah. but for new buyers... That's the main point we're making. Today. Yes. We, it needs to be as affordable as possible without breaking the bank, right. basically, right, of the government. So what is that? What is affordable as possible without breaking the bank? It is construction costs. Right? Because the land is already owned by the government and purchased at much cheaper prices previously, right? So given that they can afford... It's, it's like a housing cooperative. It should be run as a housing cooperative that already owns the land. I think so. Right, therefore, you should charge construction costs. And you get to... Uh, the government get, has charged... Um, for the land, many times, well, not many times, over at least once, uh, it has some uh, return on, on... It has made some money from They've it. made some money on it. And so the government here has a choice. And there are economic arguments on both sides, opportunity costs, etc., etc. We'll not go down that road. But what we can say is that the government could be nicer, lah. you know, I mean, and we, not charge land costs. Well, we can say more than that. We can say that for as uh, important and social item as public housing, yeah. the priority should be to that it is affordable, given the even given the other opportunity costs right. that that you should be charging that you should be you no, should no. be uh, as as as, as possible. yeah as reasonably low a price as possible. Yeah. And given that the citizens enjoy low cost housing increase their savings, they can then plough it back into entrepreneurial investments Obviously. and then generate the economic returns Absolutely. out of it. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we, we, we'd like to say tolong, you know, let's, let's be nice. Mm. And, and no, it's not about niceness. I think it's the duty of the government yes. to provide okay. public housing. I, I, I don't think it's about niceness. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> let's talk about duty. Duty. Yeah. yeah, I like that. In fact, I, I prefer that, that view than mine. Um, thank you very much. Now we're just going to talk about inherited, the inherited realities and I'm going to sketch the solutions and then we will take uh, and, and we'll come to the end of the program because we've taken a bit too long. If any of you see any questions that you'd like to deal with now, uh, we, we can talk about that. Um, but I, I think we've answered most of the, the, the questions so far posed. Okay, that's but, good. Um, the inherited reality and the constraints. To be fair, I think you need to look at what has happened. We know how we've got here. We've looked at the policies and we know how we've ended up here. You know? and, and that, I must say, that the PAP government has to, to be accountable for. But we are here. And these realities are there. Two things that we need to understand. The HDB flat has become 90% of the total accumulated wealth. This is the point that you were of making. Of the bottom 50%. Of about half 
of HDB buyers? Should 90% of one's wealth be tied up in your house? And that goes back to the World Bank study and the four pillars. And the answer, I think, is no. Too concentrated. And that's the problem. Too concentrated. So, I'll just move on. Yep. The other inescapable inherited reality we have to deal with today, no matter how we've gotten here, we've gotten here, right. is that HDB values are today high. The dilemma, therefore, is this. Homes must be affordable, but home values need to be preserved. Correct. Because, you know, you just can't take the, 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 the air out of the market and then you have uh, a whole segment of the HDB market that, that will collapse. Yes. So, my question is, which inherited realities of the HDB system concern you the most? Well, the inherited reality of the concerns us the most is, is the preservation of asset protection for the bottom 50%, especially, but for most HDB owners who are relying on the HDB asset, their main asset, for their retirement. So how do we protect this asset, given that it is going inevitably towards zero as the lease decays? Right? So that, that is the, the foremost inherited reality that we need to deal with in a pragmatic way. Sure. And what are the trade-offs we must be aware of in resolving the HDB problem, bearing in mind these inherited realities that I've just described? So I think the trade-off is... 90% of a lot of Singaporeans' wealth is in one asset. Yeah, for the bottom 50 and, and we need to... Values are high. And we need for it to be affordable to the new buyers. Therefore the, therefore, the way that we are approaching it in FOSG, is, FOSG. Yeah, is saying that, well, you need, first and foremost, let's talk about asset protection. Yes. How do you deal with that? We need to have a lease renewal process, yes. right? Now, the, the existing lease renewal process is embedded within SERS, right? Yes. So, but it's only given to 5%. So we are proposing something that is equivalent to having SERS for everybody, but in two steps. Right. The first step is that we renew the lease when the flat gets to 50 years old. I'm asking about the trade-offs, the solutions we can come to in. But how do you discuss the solutions here? Sure. The, the trade-offs if you haven't sure. talked about solutions, right? So, well, so, so you have, so you have to, 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 in the first instance, renew the lease, right? And effectively give everybody a surge at the end of the day when the building comes, becomes too old to be structurally sound, right? So that's on the one hand. And that preserves the assets. But on the other hand, you've got to make it affordable, right? So here's the trade-off. How do you make it affordable? So you've got to bring it down to construction costs, which if you can sell at construction costs, allows you to have a 10 to 15 year repayment period. But you've got to segment the two markets such that this cheaper new BTO flats doesn't pull down the price of the existing flats. So the trade-off is that you've got to have, therefore, a longer minimum occupancy period for the people who are buying the BTOs now extended from five years to 15 years to make sure that they can't just immediately go and sell on the market and pull yes. down the prices of the existing flats. In so fact, I'm glad that you, you've talked about that because we've literally run out of time. And it's good that you've sketched in broad details the FOSG right. plans. How, that, how do you talk but about that? That's all right. I, 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 I appreciate that. But yeah. I, I would have just talked about the, the various trade-offs uh, uh, simpliciter that, uh, w which are inherent in terms of the inherited realities anyway. It's, you can't have both. You can't have uh, affordable housing without taking care of uh, the chaps who have all their life savings. Right. And in, in addition, that, we would say that there are people who e even cannot afford yes. to, buy, to buy and own housing. There are people yes. right at the bottom right. yeah, that's, and, and the gig the economy people that market, need yeah. accessible access to, to affordable market. rentals yes. and, 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 and a secure tenancy which is, is inadequate at the moment. So let's end on the question of solutions. And the main point I'd like to make here is this, that in response to the growing public outcry on the issue, of course, the Prime Minister announced that a new scheme he called VERSE would be introduced to solve the HDB problem. To date, the details have been sketchy, except for the ones that you mentioned, this sort of vague on-block scheme that's coming up for uh, HDB. But what happened to VERSE, huh? You know, in the sense that we are at a GE, a general election 2020. Fair question. And the government has not said anything about VERS, and nobody is asking the government about VERS. Right. Shouldn't 
members well, I mean, of the public be be uh, concerned? Okay. No, because we have 15 more years to go. So there's, there's 15 years three, is nothing in terms another of... Another 3 GE uh, away. <laughs> Ask your questions in the next two GEs. <laughs> no, I'm asking it now. No, no. I, think I, can, I can understand your frustration, yes. Kush, because, I mean, this issue, not even GE, this issue has been, been solved five, ten years ago, right? What are you waiting for now? We're late, actually. You're late, yeah, already we're late. We're passing through right? one GE without yeah. even talking about it. But to be that fair... That is why I but, decided to talk about it. Yeah, Sorry. Good. That's thank good. you for... for yeah. Yeah. No, but it's good. But I mean, to be fair, um, I think Minister Lawrence Wong has said he's aware of the problem. <laughs> he's aware of the various solutions that have been proposed both but by the what political the party. What are we going the to do about it? I mean, we hear the minister saying every day to the opposition, you know, you identify the problem, but you don't give us the solution. What is your solution? So okay, I mean, there have been, been various solutions. What is your solution? Give <laughs> yes. us details. Correct. Now, the, the government has proposed it, said its, its initial outline of the solution, although they say uh, they haven't finished I mean, thinking it through, which is worse, right? Okay, that's the government. And, um, and the, various parties, the various parties have proposed their solutions, uh, yes, right? Yes, and okay. that's what I'm coming to. So what about this back-to-basic solution, a clean system, where you don't uh, uh, tie in retirement adequacy? And some, some parties have, have proposed... Okay, so the, cl uh, the closest to that is probably the SDP. And now, the SDP has been focused not on retirement adequacy and asset protection, but they focus on affordability. One policy. Yes, right. But two. So, yeah, so go, go for affordability, uh, charge, I think, close to, close to construction costs, mm -hmm. and segment the market, but that when you sell it, you cannot sell it on the open market, you can only sell it back to the government at cost, right? So the SDP, and that's a, a fair you know, proposal. suggestion, proposal, yeah. but it only addresses the, the issue of affordability. It doesn't address the issue of asset protection, right? On the other hand, the PSP has suggested, from what I understand, that verse, uh, SERS for everybody, yeah. right? SERS for everybody addresses... What do you see, uh, 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 would you criticise that? No, I think that's very in line with one of our policy planks, which is we are proposing that, you know, effectively you get SERS for everybody, right? right? So SD, uh, PSP has proposed to solve the asset protection problem by SERS for everybody. Right. Right? But they have not said very much about the affordability problem. So, yes... Oh, I, I don't think that's right. I think oh. um, uh, they have uh, at various times made it quite plain that they're very concerned about their affordability. Right. Have, they, have they proposed that they sell at construction costs? No. I don't yes. think that detail has yes. been so, presented so, so yet. They, they have said they're concerned, but yeah. they, haven't, they haven't proposed a concrete proposal yes. for the affordability. But they have proposed a very good proposal yes. for the asset protection. So both sides have given good partial solutions. SDP has given a good partial solution for affordability. Right. Uh, PSP has given an excellent solution for... WP and WP has proposed something similar to, to the PAP, right? Uh, which, is, which is, you know, some kind of... of Lease buyback, lease buyback scheme. scheme. Yeah. That brings us to that question. Right. Leslie Chan, is HDB lease buyback scheme a good scheme to fund retirement? It is. I think it is one of the schemes that can potentially work, but the problem with that scheme is it has been unpopular, right? Yes. And the reason it's been unpopular is the reason you alluded to earlier, because it gives you very little be bequest value at the end of the day. Right. You have to sacrifice most of your bequest value yes. in order to participate yeah. in the lease buyback so, scheme. So Yes. So it has not been popular. Yeah. And yes, of course, some people take that route and it's a valid route, but it cannot solve the whole problem. It's a partial solution, just as the verse is a partial solution. So, 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 so the, the WP has proposed a partial solution, the PAP has proposed a partial solution. Yeah. And FOCG <laughs> has a solution. But our it's solution, I think, we have, well... <laughs> Um, it's an attempt at solving all I three. Like yes, I, I think it's yeah, we don't say it's a last new. word on it, no, but you know, I it's, think a, it's, a, a, it's a very good it's starting point. It's a very good starting point to de debate to, to the, the various trade-offs. Yes. And um, I recommend everyone researches this, looks at this, but we've run out of time to discuss its details. Uh, in conclusion, and I'm, I, can I, I apologize. Just say something here yes, right please, here. please. Which please is that a, you see, the, so so. FOSG has uh, on the table thing to, to attempt to solve all three problems, right? Asset protection, you know, so on the one hand, affordability, on the, affordability, and access for the bottom yeah. rent, rent, renters and low income. The issues. Yeah, the, all of them. All of them, yeah, right? So we have, we have, we have, and you know, as you, you know, the various parties have have, have their good ideas for very, including for, for various parts of the problem, right? right? 
So how do we get to the, the, the real solution? The answer is surely there has to be much greater consultation by the government and coordination by the government yes. of, of, of public discussion on it. Now, Lawrence, to be fair to Lawrence Wong, he said, we will discuss it publicly, right? But there must be institutional, rather than just relying on the goodwill of Mr. Lawrence Wong, yes. which is considerable, yes. okay. there has to be institutional ways in which this kind of public policy is discussed. Not, not just say, well, if I've got a good minister, like Lawrence Wong, we will do it. If I, have, if I have someone who is not so consultative, it doesn't happen, right? Let's set up a new committee then. <laughs> no, so what I'm saying is, what are the institutional mechanisms? One, a select committee to... Yeah, well, to, the, the, to, the various solutions. To study the various solutions. Correct. So you, you should have independent think tanks yes. to looking at it. One. Yes. Two, you, you must have some kind of, of, of you know, uh, uh, data, uh, in public information act that you know, Allows, official uh, access to, the access to data, data, right? Okay, so that's number two. Subject number three is value. Yeah. Yeah. number three is you can have independent committees. It suggests ombudsman to look at various issues. This is an important issue, enough issue for an independent ombudsman to look at it. And finally, you need to have parliamentarians. Exactly, I was in, just coming to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're know, talking about elections <laughs> since we're having one. You have to have parliamentarians to in, in. Yeah, the talking about to, to talk give about. Give us a good. Public thorough debate. discussion with all these elements, right? Yeah, yeah. In it. We need to strengthen Parliament. And this yes. is the time. GE 2020 is an opportunity yes. to strengthen Parliament. The choice is yours. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I thought it was an engaging discussion. We need to review our public housing policy because it is no longer fit for purpose. A HCB flat is too costly and the system operates as a form of wealth transfer mechanism that undermines retirement adequacy. We need to transform our public housing. Singapore deserves better. And on that note, thank you very much for tuning in. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your thank time. You,